Welcome, everybody. I am really excited because today we are here with Deanna Montero, and she's going to talk about her unique approach to helping people in their horsemanship journey. And the way she starts people on their journey is through understanding the horse through sculpture and, and learning how to sculpt the anatomy of the horse as you are um, as you're learning about the horse and, and she's able to do this online, which I think is really cool. And, and then in through doing that, it makes you a much better rider, trainer, and partner to your horse because you're actually able to understand how the biomechanics of the horse works. And this is such an important thing that's oftentimes missed, I feel. Um, so welcome, Deanna, and I'm Hi. here with Jack, yeah. Jack as well. So. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so welcome, Deanna. So if you could share just a little bit about your your story. So I got started teaching anatomy. I, I'm a I'm a professional sculptor, and I started. Uh, I've ha I had my horse since he was a baby. So uh, my story kind of goes back to that time. I I got him when he was four months old. I was sixteen. Um, it was an Andalusian dream. You know, dream come true. That journey lasted um, a long time. He was 15 and he, I ended up sending him back to the breeder because I have my family now and I'm dedicating more to teaching and really being able to provide for him what he deserves and what he needs at the moment, I'm not able. So that, that he's at, in a beautiful place right now. Um, but I, my journey started with him and I learned about anatomy to help him after I had put him in training, came back to me and he had some major issues. He didn't want to be ridden. He didn't want to be groomed. Um, so I started looking into how I might be able to help him. And I started, you know, I, I had been sculpting for a long time, sculpting horses. And I started to think, well, I, I'd like to learn more anatomy. I'd like to know more about it and understand, you know, m more in depth, the conversations that I have with my veterinarian and uh, how I might be able to, you know, communicate better what I'm trying, what I'm seeing and feeling and maybe understand my horse better. So I started sculpting the skeletal form, the musculoskeletal structures and everything. And I actually was able to find a path that led directly to his healing through my understanding of the anatomy, um, building it in the clay, which is you know a three-dimensional way of understanding. So it's pretty real, you know, apart from like working with the actual skeletal, you know, pieces that we can, we, you know, we, you, dissecting or whatever, perhaps it's not something that everybody would like to do. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice option. Um, so you can, you can, build every structure in every form and really understand it uh, at a very you know fine detail level. So as I started doing that, I, I was searching for different methods, different training methods, different ways to build his muscles and try and help him uh, heal in certain parts of his body because I could tell you know things hurt and I wanted to ride, but he wasn't enjoying it. So I wanted us both to ha in, have that enjoyment, not just force him to do what I wanted you know, or what forced him to give me what I wanted. You know, I wanted him to enjoy himself as well. So when I, I started to really see re results about two and a half years of really studying, applying and working with him, I was able to start riding him again. He, he was really, you know, communicating and happy, excited to be with me. It was just a completely, you know, 360 turn around. Uh, and I started to, I, before that I was kind of observing other riders and their relationships with their horses and the things that they talked about, that they struggled with, that were just so similar to my struggles and the things that I saw with my horse and the things I wanted to, you know, improve or heal or whatever. So, so then I started to think, well, I think this information is just too good to keep to myself. And I wanted to try and figure out a way that I could bring it to as many equestrians as possible. And online seemed to be one of the ways that I could do that you know, internationally. So I started filming the anatomy in clay um, so that I could offer it on through courses online and people could start learning 
you know, the, the skeletal structure, the uh, muscular structure, and then talk about biomechanics, even though a sculpture, of course, doesn't move, but we can understand the biomechanics um, from the way that things fit together and the consequences of, you know, perhaps the development in cert under certain um, patterns that we might have in training or over years. So there's lots of different ways that the, uh, the student can learn, even though they're not directly interacting with the horse through the, through the clay. And then that's transferred to, okay, well, I can make connections now. I understand the back is built you know, a certain way and the horse needs to be able to lift his back so that he can support the rider. Um, and then just having that mental picture and that understanding of how the muscles are developed can ask the horse to do things that are healthy for his body rather than you know, the opposite that causes long-term damage. Um, so that, uh, that's pretty much the story in terms of what brought me to what I'm doing now. So. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And I think it's a huge piece of the puzzle. I mean, understanding the body and how the horse's body and how it works, it's, it's similar to ours, but it's also very different. And, and in order for people to really see when they're riding the things that they'd actually like to be seeing and to know the why and the how behind it, They've, mm -hmm. got, they've got to get some understanding of how all of these pieces fit together and what a wonderful way to do it because it's so hands-on, it's, it's uh -huh. kinesthetic, you know, it's, you're able to actually work with all of the little pieces and I would imagine you do it, do you do it in like layers or how do you, how do you, okay, tell us a bit about the process because I think that'd be really yeah, interesting. Yeah, for sure. I want to grab something. Okay, okay, you got it. So... Um, whoops, sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, so yeah, I did <laughs> oh, <bonk. Yeah>. <laughs> in layers. And so I teach the, I teach them to sculpt the skeleton first, right? Oh, cool. And so this is actually a tutorial I'm putting together right now. It's going to be available pretty soon. Okay. And I, I, I teach them just with nothing. We start with a ball of tinfoil and then we sculpt the, uh, the bones over it and I talk about different bones and how they fit together and you know things like you know the, the jaw for instance how it's sensitive from the horse and if it gets damaged what happens to the body uh how it might affect the back and all of those those kinds of things so I go into it not in super in, into a whole lot of detail because it's just a skull but I do talk about that while I'm sculpting and then I also do you know the other layers so in this yeah. particular one where I talk about the hoof I use a different colored clay awesome. for the different layers. Right. That is so cool. So it's it's a lot of fun. I love it. And I think it's a great way to retain the information because like you said, it's tactile, it's kinesthetic. Um, and so because you're building it, you have not only the opportunity to, you know, shape it and feel it, but um, you're you're kind of taking your time, you're you're building that. It, and it, it takes time to do it. So you're, you're thinking about that one piece for a while. So it, it kind of ingrains pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the other part that a lot of people don't realize is that there's a lot of feel that's involved in sculpting too, which transfers directly to writing, right? Um, it's not only about anatomy, it's about learning how you're using your hands and how you're using your body as well while you're sculpting so that you can achieve what you want in the clay. And if you, you know, once you internalize that idea and the, 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 uh, those techniques, um, you can transfer that to, you know, not only your hands, how you're using your hands with the reins, but also how you're using the rest of your body in the saddle. So it's a lot more um, abstract, uh, you know, technique that you learn from sculpting, but it's, uh, it's definitely applicable. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's so neat because I never, I, I, I wouldn't have thought that you'd be bringing both the, the mental mindfulness kind of be present state, which is required in this, as well as the feel. I mean, these are all such important things that we need to work on, on away from the horse. So what a perfect way to, 
yeah. do it. Yeah, what a perfect way to do it through sculpture and through understanding the anatomy of the horse. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people are astonished at how like something small up here at the head clearly is a, you know, affects all the way back to that last vertebra on the tail and mm -hmm. how interconnected that all is. And yeah. you mentioned yeah. the feel, you know, using feel as well. So this is, a, you know, a chance for them to sit there. I'm sure that people can close their eyes sometimes and feel clay, but I mean, it's different than just seeing a video or a picture or having somebody say, oh, look at the horse is stretching through its back. Now you're actually like in there. Yeah. And like you said, they take time to like process. So that's because humans, yeah. we're not very patient. Yeah. So by having that, that clay there, it's like we feel like, you know, we're doing something, right? So mm -hmm. I, I love it. And right now, are, more, are you finding more and more people are doing this since they're at home? How's that going for you? Yes, yes. There's a lot of people that are very interested in it. They be, it's a great opportunity because we have, I don't know what the situation is. I'm sure it's different everywhere. Um, but we have, uh, with COVID-19 going on right now, a lot of owners that actually can't see their horses yeah. they're um so the barns are closed they, the trainers and the grooms are taking care of the horses so it's a great opportunity for people to stay connected and uh, refine their techniques without actually you know being in the saddle or or being with their horses right so yeah it's been uh it's been a good thing i think for people yeah for sure for sure and it's uh, it's um so interesting so like like let's delve into you you showed the skull and the, the bones in the skull so can you tell us a little bit because i've heard a lot about how <clears throat> like when you have a noseband on a horse let's say and you put the noseband mm -hmm. on real tight and now you're asking the horse to flex and that jaw doesn't have the ability to drop down in the way mm -hmm. it needs to to facilitate that you know mm -hmm. that flexion can you yeah. Can you talk to us just like about things like that? I'd be real interested. I'm sure the people listening would be real interested in how this all kind of fits right. together. Yes. Yeah, so uh, anatomically what happens when the horse is, you know, behind the vertical or, or he's put into a position where he's not able to move his head upward, they, it stretches C1 and 2 mm -hmm. uh, right behind, so right at the connection of the head to the neck. And you can actually physically see a bulge right there. When, when that stretches out. And a lot of people will refer to it as like, um, uh, what is it, broken at the third vertebra? Yep, that's what you hear. Yeah. Is what I've heard. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's probably one of the most visible things that you can see in terms of, you know, what, when the head is, is down like that. And you can actually see it immediately. Um, and if the horse stays in that position, it will become permanently, you know, a permanent bolt. And, it can heal though, depending on, uh, you know, how severe it is through the stretching, you know, asking the horse to, you know, lengthen his, his, his spine. Um, but what happens is it doesn't, of course, stay in the pole. It, it causes tension in the mouth and then that causes tension throughout the whole spine and in all the, the junctions throughout the body. So it, um, you know, like you'd mentioned earlier, the connection from the mouth to the last word of written tail. It, uh, it's, it's amazing because it can show up in the lumbar vertebra, which start to you know, bunch together and they start to push up. So that's where we will start to see you know, the uh, kissing spines in different parts of the back or also affect the position of the pelvis too. So depend, but of course, there's, it's all multi-fact, there's multi-factors going on here depending on you know, how the horse is kept, how often he's moved, what kinds of exercises he does, does he jump, does he do dressage, whatever, and how the rider, of course, you know, does exercises. So everything uh, plays into all of these things. But yeah, it, the, uh, the just going behind the vertical creates a trickle effect throughout the whole body. Right. And, and that was a major issue for my horse when uh, he came back some horses are it, it's not i don't think it's a breed thing i think a lot of in a lot of cases it's a temperament thing some horses are more prone to want to be behind the vertical and um kind of want their with quotes yeah. they're um trying to they're trying to find a comfortable position 
um, whether that's from away from the hands or away from the tool that's being used. And when my horse came back, he, he would only stay behind the vertical, you know, with his chin, not, not pinned to his chest, but he was holding himself back because he didn't want to feel that tension in his, in his mouth. But of course, then it creates tension elsewhere. Um, so getting him to just kind of poke his nose out took a year um, of, you know, all sorts of different, different techniques and different things that I helped him with. Um, but the biggest was you know, walking relaxed with his head, allowing him to put his head where he wanted it, uh, which was down. And because that's the early stages when they're weak, they want to put their head down in the natural grazing position and, um, and just poke that nose out. But it takes a long time because they get, they get uh, nervous because uh, they think they're going to hit something that, that hurts. Right. Yeah. And think about horses and the chewing action of their jaw, you know, how it comes down and it kind of grinds and there's that slight lateral rotation as they chew. And think about a horse chewing and then think about a flash nose band or some people call them figure eight or drop nose bands. Right. So you put that on so mm -hmm. they can't chew. So they don't, they can't re fully relax because licking, we always talk about licking and chewing. Yeah. It's not just mm -hmm. relaxation. That's the stomach juices. It's the, like digestion. It's, it's that relaxed state. And so people will clamp that mouth shut and then their horse is perpetually stiff mm -hmm. in, the, in the pole. Mm -hmm. so defensive? De defensive, right. And it's like you take that flash off and that nose band off and the horse automatically, they start to kind of loosen up and they ch you get that chewing motion going mm -hmm. again. Um, but any yeah. thoughts on, on like the flash nose bands, the, the chewing, that type of thing? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I, and I, I agree. I, I'm not against using nose bands, or, but I am against using certain ones. <laughs> um, and also, it's important not to put them on too tight because, like you said, it prevents them from chewing and their, their dog does move back from side to side it, uh, when they, because it's natural for them to have that grinding um, you know, action with their mouth. It's the only way that they can move. And so if we're restricting that, they end up biting their tongue too. So if we put, the, if we put it on too tight, they'll actually pinch their tongue. Um, yeah. if, and by restricting the tongue, it actually, you know, it, it causes direct pain or discomfort into the horse's pole, which we've already talked about what happens. You know, if the horse has discomfort in his pole, then know we're back to causing problems throughout the whole horse the whole body of course um but yes i i ended up with my horse same classic issue you know nose band was too tight didn't want to put a bit in his mouth um uh, when i got him back he would you know bob his head up and down when he saw it and you know kind of hold his head up he was tall he was a 16 hand horse and i'm only 411 so it wasn't, he was, it was pretty easy for him to get, get away from me. Um, so I was like, well, this doesn't work. So we need to think of something else. I completely chucked the nose band and there was no issue. It, you know, I've had people tell me, well, you have to put the nose band on, on otherwise he's going to grab the bit and run away or, you know, whatever. Right. And <laughs> the whole list of possibilities, right? <laughs> And I, okay, well, I'll take my chances. <laughs> and so I, I checked the, the nose band. And of course, he, he, at first he experimented, right, with, oh, I have freedom. Now, what can I do with this freedom? And he, uh, I mean, he only experimented for maybe a day, day two. Um, and he found out, well, I, he can chew, he could relax. He could, you know, when he actually started to, feel that relaxation when he would put his head out, poke his nose out. And then his, it, it was a, he was a funny horse. He, he has a sort of a, a sense of humor. He not, some horses flap their ears, right? Well, he would flap his lips when he was relaxed. And I just, just I always thought it was funny because you get this relaxed look in his eyes and then his lips would start relaxing <laughs> and then he would start blowing air. Um, but yeah, it, it started with removing the nose band, which, because it, there's a, it, they're really sensitive in their nose. The nasal bone is really thin and there's a lot of nerves in there. So if we put 
it on really tight, then we're not only, you know, causing discomfort up in the, in that area of the nasal bone, but also under the chin, which also has a lot of nerves too, which is a, just the face is all a very sensitive place. You, know, you don't, probably wouldn't want anybody to strap something, you know, really tight onto your face. With a, with a bit, with a metal bit in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. With a metal bit in yeah. your mouth, yeah. It's <laughs> not something desirable for anybody. No. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> what about moving back now? You talk about floppy ears, and I love it when a horse is soft and they're kind of seeking, for, so they're sort of coming up and forward and they're soft, kind of stretching a little bit, and mm -hmm. you can pick them up in, in your hand and you're walking and their ears are flopping. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, obviously they're relaxed, but some horses really flop their ears like a mule almost, right? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts yeah. on the, that, the ears and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think it's it's just by horse, it depends, because some horses, I, I like to observe, you know, just sit and observe horses, and regardless of what the rider is doing, and just see how they respond. And some horses, even though they're tense, they'll flap their ears. Mm. So it's not always an indication of relaxation. Um, mm. For some of them, it is. I always tell people, well, it's, um, it's not one sign. It's like, a, it's a combination of 10 or 20 signs that the horse is relaxed. So is, does your horse, you know, soften his eyes and flop his ears? Then probably that's, that's an indication for that horse. But if another horse is like his head's behind the vertical and uh, his back is dropped, but he's flopping his ears, it's probably not a, not a good indication. So uh, I, so observation is a huge, a huge thing not only for you know understanding my horse but also understanding how to sculpt i use um you know you take a couple of minutes to observe the living animal um it, it depends on what i'm teaching you know sometimes i do live sculpture as well so i teach the students to observe the horse and then choose a composition and and we go through the sculpting process that way too so we're kind of opening their eyes um, to the communication of the horse. How does how does he express his eyes? What's he doing when he with his tail when his eyes look like that? Or um, you know, so connecting the front and the back and through the the observation is is uh, is a big big part of it as well. You're talking about the whole horse, you know. You're mm -hmm. saying you know, and I like that because that's a good point that that some horses might I have a horse that she'll pop her lips a little bit mm -hmm. actually quite a bit she's younger and she has so anyway you know I always perceive that to be tension but the rest mm -hmm. of her feels really great and her yeah. eyes are blinking and she's, and, soft, and she's and soft and I guess you and know, we've always been like oh if just that one thing would mm -hmm. you know if she could just get quiet enough but maybe you know maybe that's and something. she'll do it without a bit as well yeah but oh, maybe yeah. maybe you're right that look at the other look at what the rest of the horse is saying and for that mm -hmm. individual perhaps that it doesn't mean tension for her mm -hmm. um, it might just right? mean it might mean maximum relaxation so it's about yeah observe, observing the individual yeah, that's interesting. Um, a lot of times you get this idea of you know, kind of the idea of a box, right? This is what correct looks like. Whereas correct looks different with everybody. <laughs> right. Every horse is a little bit different. It, even though we have a baseline, of course, right? It's not gonna be like, um, what would be a good example? I don't know. It, it, we start with a baseline, but then, you know, when we start getting into the details, each one is a little bit, you know, different and, and paying attention. <laughs> That's my that's my ten month old. <laughs> uh, you can hear me. Oh, one second. Yeah, okay. no problem. The whole and and so now oh, go, you're well, and that's that's something that I think you know every horse is so nuanced and being right. able to to pull in the entire picture and take a look at it rather mm -hmm. than just focusing on one individual thing is important, but just the ability to teach people to observe and from the sounds of, of what you're talking about it, it sounds like you've got such an amazing way to teach people to observe the whole horse and then they're taking it they're putting it into some work with their hands you know working mm -hmm. on feel working on being quiet but then I'm sure you have to have them observe again mm -hmm. so there's this constant like back and forth where mm -hmm. you're observing 
you're working with your hands, you're creating something and then observing again. And that's writing. Yes. You speak and you, you say, okay, now I, what is my horse saying that I just told it? How did that feel to him? And then you change and horses, mm -hmm. riding horses is very much like sculpting. It is. And even the muscle tone, because, you know, I'll, I'll tell students we'll experiment with muscle tone. So I'll say, you know, sit like jello. So they're, they're too loose, you know? And then I'll say, sit like wood, and they're too stiff, and the horse will hollow and slow down. And then I'll say, now sit like clay. And, and so we're finding ways to teach, you know, muscle tone, yeah. or, or to put, to describe that and working with clay, that would make, that would make perfect sense. And even somebody yeah. grabbing clay and squeezing clay, yeah. um, you know, what a good teaching aid that, that, that is. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you're, I don't know of anybody else that does this. No. I don't know either. <laughs> so you're one of the kind. Not, not directly related to uh, riding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I that's I when I started you know searching for a, a healing process for my horse I realized it was me. I needed to make the adjustments and um, my best tool was sculpting. Right. Yeah. So I have a question for you, and it's in regards to, um, I guess you'd call them horse riding simulators. So like at horse fairs, you'll have these things. And, you know, I get it. It's data for feedback for the rider. So if I'm sitting heavy on one sit bone versus the other, or if I'm pushing on my left stirrup more, I get it. It's feedback for the rider. But to actually make a simulated horse, I don't know if they'll ever be able to do that because the way they move and certain muscles stretch and certain muscles contract and it's so dynamic that I don't think riding simulators, I think it'd be really hard to make one. So as a, as an artist and a sculptor and somebody that rides horses, what are your thoughts on like the whole riding simulator thing? And, and is it possible to make one that would actually feel like a, a horse? <laughs> Right now, I don't know. I have never tried to make one, so I don't. I don't know. Um, I think it's pretty cool. The data. I like data. Um, I think it's pretty cool the information that you can collect from it. But I don't know how much it helps in terms of applying to your riding. If you take maybe a rider that's completely unaware of their seat bones or you know the, the way that they're using their body, then yeah, I think it could be beneficial. But there's other ways also that, for instance, I, when I talk about, I do clinics and um, I talk about rider position, for instance, and we, we, we do a self-observation self as well um, before starting to sculpt. And we do some exercises uh, in terms of the way that you're sitting or you know, do you have good posture? Uh, where are your seat bones? So if you're sitting on a on a hard surface, it's pretty easy to feel because it's, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> and if you put your hands under your under your bottom while you're sitting, you can feel your your seat bones. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, but I, I think it's a pretty cool idea. I think um, maybe as it develops, it might become more uh, more sophisticated. Uh, but simulating a horse. I think that's pretty complicated because they're very complex animals. And um, I'd be surprised if we could simulate something that was, you know, equal yeah. <laughs> or at least close to equal because um, they're, they're living creatures. Each one is a little bit different. Um, they respond differently to, you know, each different person because every person is also different our energy, <laughs> it really affects them too. So, uh, which is something that a machine won't respond to. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, there, I think there's some benefit, there could be some great benefits to it, but I think there's also things that, you know, benefits to being with the horse that you can never get with a machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I like, um, I'm, I'm kind of going back just a little bit, but I like how you said, you realized that in order to help your horse, it came down to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important thing for people to understand is we have to be an educated advocate for our horses. And mm -hmm. to become that, we need education, right? We need to learn more about them and learn about their, their body, their mind, because they're both so interconnected to be mm -hmm. able to communicate to the veterinarians like, like you were speaking to earlier, you've got to have a general idea of what's going on because they're not going to exhibit the exact things 
in front of the vet that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis and that sort of thing. So uh, what would be some key areas people should kind of key into? Some things that you see come up fairly regularly when assessing horses or when observing horses that, that you would encourage people to kind of look at and become real familiar with when working with their own horses so that they can, they can see maybe potential problems coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I would start by observing one's energy, <laughs> personally. Hey, uh -huh. How are you approaching your horse? Are you finding some, you know, do you come away kind of feeling the same every time? And if that's a dissatisfaction where that might be coming from? Um, I talk about that a lot because usually when we're having a problem, it's because we're approaching the issue not in a way that's going to be helpful to the horse, right? So um, it's observing the horse at some of the issues. I, well, I would say some of the biggest issues that come up, right, are, are just general tension with the horse. And then they're creatures of habit. So we teach them to be tense. They're just going to naturally be that way when we pull them out of their stall. And some days are going to be worse than others. And if it, and it's accumulative too, right? So if we don't release that tension, it eventually just becomes a, a ball of tension that's eventually gonna. So starting from that idea of where can I, how can I make myself relax so that I can transfer that to my horse? And then I think once you start kind of you know, pointing the finger back at yourself <laughs> rather than at your horse, which is a hard thing to do because, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of, it's a lot of work to really kind of peel away the layers and see yourself as, you know, it, it's hard, not, not that it's not a, a lack of honesty or whatever, but it's, it's hard to kind of pinpoint what you need to work on. Sometimes other people are able to see that easier than yourself. Um, but a, kind of having that mental, uh, picture or that mental uh, that idea of how I'm going to approach my horse so that I can help him relax is is helpful because then you start to create make these connections of how you can um, kind of prepare yourself or start even start your day um, with you know more relaxation and and apply that to you know by the time that you get to your horse you're not you know tense or you're not like you don't have the weight of the day on you <laughs> yeah totally right? and so i think i mean it's kind of an abstract idea but it's uh it's, it's just so important to start from that idea of what am i transferring to my horse and how can i what changes what can i do to uh, you know be the most positive possible so that i'm not causing you know, things that I don't want to cost in my yeah. riding or in my interaction. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I, th I think it does really boil down to where we're at emotionally, mm -hmm. physically too, right? Because that, mm -hmm. that emotional energy kind of creates what we are physically. Yeah. And then and then understanding how much that affects the horse and how interesting coming from somebody that's teaching, you know, the biomechanics, the how all the pieces fit together, understanding the musculature, the skeletal anatomy of the horse. And here she is saying, <laughs> what do we need to work on the most? And it's our own energy. Which yeah. Is <laughs> yeah, because it's not about the mechanics, really. It's, it's about understanding the mechanics so that we can understand the, ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that just that just sounds so weird, but it's true because you know anybody on any I think anybody that works in anything ends up comes to the conclusion that oh I need to work on myself. Yeah, it's it's not out there. It's actually in here, and um, and and a lot of people think oh you're teaching anatomy, but I want to teach feel or I want to teach you know, but I, like I said you know we kind of start at a baseline and. And if we can start at a baseline, we teach what we can see and what we can, you know, um, build in this case, then we can move to the more abstract ideas of uh, feel and energy. 
because we start, I think if we start directly from feel, it's like, well, it's, it's, it's more difficult because I remember when I was younger being taught to ride and it's like, no, it's a field, understand this. And I was a little kid. So I'm like, okay, it feels fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just want to canter around <laughs> and it feels fine <laughs> to me. Um, but it, it, so explaining it through like, well, these are the structures and the reason you want to work on your feel is because then it, it affects the horse's back like this, you know, it, making the kind of making these connections. And of course, it, I mean, they, to me, it's, it's kind of becomes difficult to, to explain it through words, but when you're starting to build it and you, you're, then you're transferring that and working with your horse, you start to go, oh, so if his back does that, that's what it feels like, right? Right. And it's not like I can say, yeah, it feels like X, Y, and Z, <laughs> because it might feel a little bit, it'll feel a little bit different if I'm working with my horses, you know, my 1600 horse versus, you know, somebody's 14 hand pony. And, you know, so everything is going to, you know, it's all a little bit variable. Right. Yeah. No, that, that's really cool. And, and the, the slowing down and feel is taught, you know, through your hands-on kinesthetic approach. You're, you're, you're creating a scenario. It's hard when people are just with their horses. It's, it's them and their horse. Then you add an instructor. So mm -hmm. now they've got this pressure of being on their horse, trying to interpret what's going on here, trying to listen to the instructor, trying to like perform. Some people feel like that pressure to perform in front of their instructor. Mm -hmm. They want to show their instructor they're doing good and doing right. And so there's mm -hmm. so much feedback that to develop feel in that space can be a little bit difficult for many. So in, moment, right? yeah, so in the, in the env environment that you're creating, you're really allowing them to slow down it's bringing that energy to the place that they need to have their energy when they're riding and then they're able to develop the feel and then through that you're also i'm sure talking about the understanding and how this all works together and and it's just um, it's really intriguing it's a really intriguing way of going about doing this and i can see that it would be very effective Mm -hmm. for people to take one of your courses and go through this and really start to understand how all of these pieces fit together. Definitely. I wonder if you took like high-end riders or whatever, equestrians, and if you said, okay, sculpt a horse that you'd like to see. So like, uh, let's pick on dressage. So, so you ask the Grand Prix rider, you say, sculpt the horse that you'd like to, to be on. And then you had them ride and does that horse match their, their, their vision? Does that horse match the horse they sculpted? Right. Right. Now, obviously they, they're not going to be able to sculpt that. What, you know, possibly be able to sculpt that well, <laughs> but I'm trying to say like, does the product, does the horse they're riding, does it match their vision mm -hmm. or does it look like something completely different Is the horse over flexed and gaping or whatever? You wouldn't sculpt that. Right. Yeah. So, well, but you do see that in art. I guess you do. You do see that, you know, over flexed right. horse with the gaping mouth, which is, really too bad because yeah. it's not beautiful i mean one thing about um, art you. is it's an expression of truth so unfortunately that's one that's the truth that we have in the equestrian world mm -hmm. and it's sad because we do we see it a lot and our, our artists they don't know what they're sculpting or they're painting they're just doing what they see and mm -hmm. unfortunately that kind of comes back to the equestrian world how well are we educating our writers and our students and but yeah it's 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 a shame you see and, the and that's, yeah i'm sorry i'm well, sorry go ahead well you, you see the resistance in there and of course a lot of arts is like you know battles and stuff like that so you see horses that are at war in a stress state or um and you're right i guess you know they are sculpting what they see or painting what they see mm -hmm. and you're right the truth is a lot of horses are stressed and mm -hmm. you know that that's done and and res, you know and resistance can't be beautiful you know i'm kind of paraphrasing and you know that's yeah. my version of the saying but it's almost like if people could in their mind envision um the softness and a horse that's that's really almost like play or curiosity 
You know, mm -hmm. if they could get that in their mind and now go ride. Yeah. I just yeah. think that would help. That would change things a lot for horses. Yeah. It definitely would. I, I agree. And then I like that you mentioned playfulness because that's something when I started incorporating that with my horse, um, it really started to see that sparkle where he, he was just you know, excited. He was like, I could play, I can experiment. Yeah. And, um, and then they, you start to get that communication, that back and forth communication. It's not just me telling him what to do. Um, he is saying, well, let's try this. It's, could this work? And we'll be like, well, you know, let's try it this way. And, and then you start to have that silent communication, which is really neat. And then, and that goes back to learning the feel and learning to slow down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And neat. So, I'm sure we've got a bunch of people listening that would love to learn more about you and your work and what you do. So how, how can they, how can they get more involved with you and learn more about, about you? Uh, well, they could uh, look at my website. I have uh, two websites. Uh, DeannaMontero.com is where uh, you can take the online courses for the sculpture anatomy. I also have sculptureanatomy.com if you want to learn more about the um, sculpting of the horse, just what it is, you know, um, what it means. And yeah, I also have a Facebook page, Sculpture Equine Anatomy on Facebook. And uh, I also have my Instagram as well. Same name. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so Sculpture Equine Anatomy is what they want yeah. to. If they're going to Google something, that would be, you're going to pull up on. on that would be, the, yeah, for the, the horse anatomy stuff. That would be, yeah. Good. Do you work with like bit, like bits and bidding and like with a clay horse, like a, like a skull? Do you, t do you talk about bits at all with, with, at your clinics? I, I haven't done a whole lot. I mean, I mentioned that it's important to use a bit that's, that is comfortable. And I, you know, you choose to use a bit, I, I suggest the French link snaffle, uh, just the loose ring, because I think it, it fits the mouth the, the best, and it, it creates the least amount of discomfort you know, on the bars of the mouth. And you can get them with the flat link in the middle too, so it doesn't poke the mouth, doesn't poke the, the palate. Um, making sure that they fits, you know, so I do talk about that uh, a little bit, but I don't, I haven't done any like sculpting of the clay with a bit. Um, I talk about it in some of my videos. Oh, I my YouTube channel also. I have, oh, yeah. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I talk about it in my videos on YouTube a little bit. Um, and, but it's more about how, you know, the discomfort or the comfort of a bit can help the horse be more relaxed throughout his body. And, but I don't go into it a whole lot. Okay. Sure. What is your YouTube channel? Just the, the name of it. The same. Sculpture okay. Equine Anatomy. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good to keep it simple straight yeah. across yeah. the board. That's, <laughs> That's yeah, it, it, I think it's best that way. But I have, an, I have a qu another question. Do you, do you sculpt? What else do you sculpt? What else do you do for? Because you said you're a professional sculptor. Oh. I sculpt in bronze. Those are a couple bronze sculptures oh, okay. behind me. Uh, and, but it's mostly horses. I'm actually right now working on a tutorial of the human figure. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, so this is something that's not up yet, and I haven't mentioned it publicly. But I'm working on tutorials on rider anatomy um, so that then we can sculpt the horse and the rider together and see how two figures that are just so different come together so it's uh yeah i but i don't i don't professionally sculpt humans it's mostly horses okay yeah yeah how cool that bring that both super, together super wow cool. yeah yeah it's really i can tell you're creative and you're full of ideas and so then do you do you take like chalk or paint and do you mark like a real like a physical horse for people to see like the anatomy so what i like to do it this is actually for my younger students. Um, I did a collegiate clinic here at Stanford uh, equestrian last summer. I did three clinics, I think, for them. And they, what I did is I just got a bunch of paint. I had a big poster of the anatomy of the horse. We, it was a short, it was, I think, two hour, two to three hour clinic. So we didn't have a lot of time. But uh, we decided to paint the haunches, which is you know a vital part of the the movement, getting correct movement. 
of the horse. And of course, they're very focused in competition. So we talked about, you know, the health of, of the horse so that they're more com competitive. Um, and, but I took them and I told them to paint it onto the horse. So I didn't do it for them. I, so I said, okay, we're going to, we're going to paint the, the, the skeleton of the horse on, you know, the haunches of the horse, uh, on directly onto the horse. And they're like, I'm not artistic. I can't do that. I've never done that before. <laughs> they're all teenagers. Right. And so it's like, it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just, I just want you to give it a try. Because when we when we give ourselves that freedom to try things, right. then we're less afraid, and we can communicate better with our horses. So we, we get over that fear factor, um, which is a big uh, contributor to injuries when we're riding, right? Yeah, right. definitely. So kind of, you know, getting over that through expressing themselves in the art and painting the the skeleton on the on the horse. It, so we talked about that and, and they had a lot of fun. They were like, Hey, I can actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, we to cover some things up and fix some things and talk about, you know, if it was, if that bone was that shape, would the horse be able to move? And they were like, well, no. So let's go ahead and fix it. Um, so it, it was really neat because they started to think about, you know, how the horse is structured and how he moves and, and then also you know, kind of get, naturally getting over fear of, of failing because of they're trying something that they've never tried before. Right. Yeah. And you would think that people that ride horses, we need to be somewhat creative and we need to have a vision of what we want from our horse and what, how we want our horse to, to go. Uh -huh. And so mm -hmm. by painting, it's like you're taking them to sort of the creative side of their mind. Mm -hmm. Of, yes. So that when they ride, maybe they're in that place versus, uh -huh. like you said, the worry, that block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty much, you know, all of our, you know, all of our presenters at the fair, we talk about that, you know, slowing down and relaxing yeah. Yeah. and not having fear as a blocker. Uh huh. Um, so that's super, super interesting. And yeah. I'm sure with the painting and with the sculpture, they're stepping away from it and then right. feeling empower empowered mm -hmm. as well. Right. Because they're uh -huh. like, oh, look, I yeah. actually yeah. Could. <laughs> I actually could do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times people are really afraid to try things that are art related because I think that there's kind of a, um, this idea of you have to create a masterpiece because you know if you're doing anything art related, and you know it's no, you actually just have to have fun. <laughs> you need yeah. to enjoy the process, <laughs> right? And have fun with it, and every time you do it, you're gonna get a little better. And, yeah, yeah, and awesome. Totally, and that goes back to the energy piece that you right. talked about earlier. Right. Our energy coming to our horses mm -hmm. is so important. So if we're coming to our horses nervous and stressed and thinking we have to create this masterpiece it's not going to be fun for either of us. But if we just go out yeah. there and we just want to have fun and that's why kids and horses, kids, you know, they they're not do it. doing yeah. everything yeah. perfect. Kids are the best. They're the best. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, that's such a good point though that, and it's funny that, you know, we come, we come back to this. And, and so hearing it from somebody like you, that's that creative artist type saying it. It's just, it's cool. It's refreshing. So yeah. we appreciate it. Yeah. That. Kids and horses are great, yeah. aren't they though? Right. Yes, they are. And I, I grew up with miniature horses mm -hmm. and, um, we had, we had a breeding farm. We had a little stallion and a bunch of brood mares and the little stallion was funny. He was very difficult with my mom, but anytime any of us kids would do anything, he was perfect. He yeah. just stand <laughs> and, and because we were just, you know doing stuff we were just having fun with him and 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 we were relaxed we didn't have any expectations for him and I think maybe that's uh, expectations are kind of what get in the way uh, in a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right I think you're yeah. right his mom had minis as well she brought and she showed minis and was so in my teenager teenage years she had a few minis and we had some big horses but then I'd say in my 20s she started breeding miniature horses so she's got like a hall of famer and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah same um, way. So, so you ever, you hear about artists that they, they make like a painting or a sculpture, but to them, they don't like the way it looks. And so they'll put it aside and then they'll come back to it and they'll say like, come back to it the next day or come back to it a few days later. Do you ever look at your own work and like question it or do you, do you have that happen at all? Yes. 
of a lot. Um, and actually, I incorporate that in the process of sculpting, um, assessing the quality of the work as I'm progressing. And I, I talk about that in the uh, tutorials and in the, the online courses. And it actually, the more, the longer I've been sculpting, the better I'm at assessing my work in the moment, rather than putting it away, covering it up, and not looking at it for several days. Um, it's, I think it's actually, it, you get to the point where you've refined your eye um, and you can pinpoint things faster. But I think it's just a matter of, you know, practice and, and fixing issues. And every, every sculptor, every artist ha has to go through that process of, of fine tuning. You know, it's not like you do something perfect the first time. Every time you do something, you have to fine tune it. And it's the same as when you get on your horse, you have to warm him up and fine tune him and then get to quote unquote, the fun stuff that, you know, people are excited to, to do with their horses. Yeah. yeah, and put them and put them away, and and you know, yeah, and, and then cool them down. Yeah, the whole process. It's the same with the sculptures. Yeah. You know, as I'm, um, I keep my sculptures on a lazy susan so that I can turn okay. them while I'm sculpting. Mm -hmm. So because of course it's a three dimensional object, so you want to be able to put something on, look at it from every angle, and so I naturally put it on, turn it, put something on, turn it, or or smooth it and turn it. And so it's a constant um, adjusting, there's constant adjustments that are happening throughout the process. And then of course, I'll come back the next day and look at it and go, that elbow is a little bit higher than, than the other one, or um, you know, the, the head isn't exactly where I, I wanted it, or maybe my proportions are slightly off, so I'm gonna fix it. Um, and then you do that all the way through from the beginning to the end, and you get to the end and it's the way that you want it, right? Because you're making those adjustments all the way through so uh -huh. yeah <laughs> how do you how do you keep your clay moist as you're it's oil based it doesn't dry so oh. it can actually reuse it cool. yeah oh. and i actually sell kits for my students and so they can reuse um, almost all of their materials except the the armature that it's built on um, which is aluminum you can reuse it a little bit, maybe two or three times, but in, until it gets too flimsy and starts to break. But everything else, yeah, it's reusable. Well, good. Well, thank you so much yeah. for joining us here today. Is there anything else that you'd like to, before we finish and wrap up, anything else you'd like to share or leave the viewers or listeners with? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for listening and then also for this great opportunity to talk to you guys. I think this is, it's wonderful to know that there's other equestrians that have the same kind of vision and um, they're on you're, you're on a quest to help horses be more calm and relaxed and of course through that we help riders be safer and enjoy their the time they spend with their horses too so you know i want just wanted to say thank you to you and everybody that's listening well thank you and we appreciate yeah. all the work you're doing and being here and and it's it's really interesting thank you so much and thank you to everybody who joined in today so yeah so, all right, well, we will see you all and have a wonderful day. Yep. Bye. <laughs> Bye.